we're happy you're here tonight um, for this overview of the Common Core standards that are going to be coming on board really soon, as Mrs. Golden told you. Um, it's really nice because really we're a team, parents and educators, administrators, because you know we are an integral part in your child, our students' lives in helping them find academic success. And even greater than that, what we want for them is to be responsible, resilient, respectful, engaged world citizens. That's really important. So that's our goal as educators, and I'm assuming that's what you want for your child as well. And so we um, have this symbiotic kind of relationship that I think is, um, is, is really the most important thing for the kids. Um, I want to ask you a question first of all. What skills do you hope your child has when he or she graduates from high school? I'd like you just to take a, a moment to kind of think through that. Does anyone want to share your thoughts? The old fashioned way. Old fashioned way, yes. Uh, first thing that came to mind, I guess, was the ability to think independently and make decisions accordingly and to be able to analyze things that come to you in life and how do you how do you handle them? Okay. So critical thinking skills, thinking independently. Good. Anybody else want to share your thoughts? Yes. Uh, skill to make a living, especially financially independent. Oh, yes. We do want that for our kids, right? He, we want to repeat the question again. Can you repeat your question? I mean, the answer, I'm, I'm sorry. To make a living. To make a living, yes. To make a living. That's what we want for all of our kids, you're right. Yes? Um, to count change without the use of the register. <laughs> To count change without the use of a register. That's an important one, too. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, anyway, you know, you have a vision, and we have a similar vision for your child as well and your children. Um, I wanted to um, kind of give you a little background first on the standards. Um, in 1997, uh, California adopted the first state academic standards. And um, it was a bold precedent, basically, because this had not been done before. But we needed a way to, you know, um, improve academic education and define exactly what the students are needing to know. And so um, the, the standards came into existence, and that's what we're using right now. And we're getting ready to transition now to the new standards called the Common Core State Standards. Um, it was part of the commitment that you know we have to hire uh, or to um, have um, quality education, basically. And it was in August of 2010 where California came together with uh, 45 other states, and, and uh, the the new standards were adopted. They're more rigorous. Um, they um, used um, research and input from professional communities, from state departments, from teachers, uh, uh, students, parents, and they had uh, scholars involved. And so it was, they've been really thought out of what's best for our kids to live in the world now and, of course, in the world to come. Uh, so, so Oh, thank you. Um, so the purpose of this meeting is to, let me take a look here, um, to go over an overview of the standards, um, of the Common Core standards. How will uh, instruction and assessment be different? We're going to talk about some of the instructional shifts, uh, not only in English language arts, but in mathematics as well. Um, we're going to talk about the Smarter Balance assessments that the students will be taking. And then um, how Pleasanton Unified School District is going to be implementing the Common Core and rolling it out. 
At the end, we're going to have a Q&A session at that time, too. So and it looks like we're doing it all along, really, since Dwayne sets you up. So. First of all, we'd like to share a video with you by the Hunt Institute. And um, it's a nice introduction you know, in a brief way to, you know, uh, help you understand basically what the, the standards are and then we'll delve further into that. So we're going to show you a brief video right now. For decades, we've been debating how to improve schools in the United States. This has been born from a realization that in an ever-changing world, our students need better knowledge and tools to prepare them to compete in the global economy. In math, science, and reading, our students haven't been keeping pace with their most advanced international peers. Persistent and dramatic achievement gaps still exist in our country. College remediation rates are abysmal, and employers say students are unprepared to perform and thrive in the workforce. The need to audaciously confront these issues resulted in a remarkable collaborative effort. The promise of consistent, shared, and rigorous education standards for all students that align with college and work expectations. A new set of ambitious academic standards to set the foundation for even greater student growth and success. These standards, now being implemented by more than 44 states across the nation, were built upon strengths and lessons learned in states. They were informed by other top performing countries and grounded in research and evidence and practitioners, content experts, teachers, researchers, and leaders in higher education and business all came together to make it happen. These standards were developed by states and for states. They are the clearest statements yet about the knowledge and skills that students need to master in order to be prepared for college and the workforce. The standards were designed with great care to ensure that they were clear, consistent, rigorous and relevant. All are undeniably important when it comes to preparing students to successfully meet the demands of college and the workplace. Thanks to the unprecedented collaboration among states, young people, regardless of their background or where they live, will be taught to standards that once mastered will have prepared them for college and career success. Take a glimpse into the promise of these standards as states do the hard work of implementing them with fidelity and care. Use what you hear to start engaging conversations, stimulate creativity in the classroom, help align expectations, and get communities involved. Find out why state standards are far from common. A new foundation, that's really what it is uh, for student success. And um, there's going to be some shifts that take place, the changes that take place from moving from our old standards to the new Common Core standards. And um, I would like you to take a look at the, at the uh, PowerPoint up here to ensure that our students are meeting college and career expectations provided a vision, what it means to be a 21st century learner, prepare to succeed in our global economy and society, and provided with rigorous content, basically. Um, all of these incorporate what we call the 21st century skills of what our kids need. Uh, every child in America needs to be able to um, be ready for today's world and tomorrow's world both. And so um, what was found in research that um, there was a profound gap between um, the knowledge and the skills that our students were learning um, and then going off to college and seeing that there was quite a difference. So the new standards are going to address that. So this is going to be um, really a wonderful thing for kids. Um, they're going to align classroom environments now basically with the real world. 
Um, in addition to the 21st century um, uh, learning, part of it is going to be weaving in some of these um, interdisciplinary themes. Um, when we talk about wanting our, our kids to be global learners and you know good world citizens, um, there will be aspects woven in from global, global awareness, uh, financial, economic, business, and entrepreneurial literacy, civic literacy, health li literacy, and as well as environmental literacy. So to succeed in a global you know, society economically and socially, um, and our, you know, we need to, to have these skills. Our jobs today are very different than they were you know, years ago, and they're a bit more demanding. So what do the new standards look like? OK, thank you. Um, first of all, um, there are fewer of them, okay, and they're higher level and clearer. Fewer doesn't mean they're going to have less learning involved. It just means they're, they've uh, pulled together the most essential standards. They're aligned with college and career expectations for the 21st century skills that we just talked about. And additionally, they have added a college and career readiness um, component to it which are um, 10 anchor standards that will be throughout the disciplines of history, social science, science, um, as well as the te technological um, subjects. So um, included with this common core standards um, are what we call the CCR, the College Career Readiness Standards. And those are the 10 that kind of anchor the document and um, as I said, are cross-disciplinary and um, uh, are the literacy expectations that will be dispersed throughout all of the content areas. So if you go into a history class, um, not only will you be reading more complex texts, but you will also be writing more um, and writing in a more purposeful way. So that's gonna be across the disciplines. Um, they're also internationally benchmarked um, with the NAEP, um, National Assessment for Educational Progress. Uh, there's a NAEP test that's given and they have tried to align with that test. Um, and everything is research-based, evidence and research-based um, in the new standards. So the basics. We have um, English language arts, and uh, we have math standards, and the two in math are content skill area, which are domains, as well as mathematical practices. Um, in English language arts, we have four strands, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and there's also language. I don't think language is up here, though. Yeah. Um, we have four strands, and I'll be talking a little bit more about those later. We have the literacy strands, as I mentioned earlier, in, the, in history, social science, science, and uh, technical subjects as well. Um, the shifts, changes, that are going to be taking place in English language arts instruction, um, it's going, the instruction's going to be grounded in evidence from the text. Uh, we need to use, um, we need to be able to have our kids to have evidence, to go into text, find evidence, and make meaning from that. They need to carefully analyze once they go into the text, and then have well-defended claims. Um, and clear information, and we were talking about critical thinking skills earlier, that's exactly what this is, and that's what we're trying to, um, uh, skills we're trying to build in our students to create. Um, when you are going into a text and looking deeply at that, we call that close reading. It's not close reading like this, but it's close reading in that you're delving into the, the text, 
analyzing it and trying to make meaning from it. Because we tell our students, when you get to high school, when you get to college, you have a plethora of reading to do. And so um, the more apt they are at doing the skill of close reading, um, they're going to you know, be better off in the academic setting. Um, secondly, there's an increased use of content-rich nonfiction. This plays an essential role in the new Common Core standards, especially in grades 6 through 12. Um, there's a greater emphasis on, um, uh, on literary nonfiction. The chart um, in back of me is um, a chart that shows basically the breakdown between literary um, and informational text. If you'll look at eighth grade, okay, so if you have fourth grade and, you, and then eighth and then twelfth, if you want to look at eighth grade, 45 percent of what the kids are reading throughout all of the disciplines should be um, literary text and in eighth grade 55 percent would be the informational text. And by the time you are in um, your senior year, 70% of your reading should be informational because that's what um, we do when we get to college, right? So um, that's going to be a, a, one of the big shifts. More um, informational texts will be you know, um, given to the students to try to delve into. Um, like I said, it doesn't matter, um, you know, it's not just the English departments that will be teaching all of this. However, it will be dispersed among all the disciplines, so everybody's going to be teaching literacy along with their content area. Do you have a question? Yeah, is this, this is, you're talking just ELA, the English literacy. Is this just the English literacy? So, the, within just the English discipline, they're going to be doing more. Fact. Could you give examples what, of what's in literary what, and what's in information? So we're going to be we're like literary piece would be a you know, fictional like, piece. Oh. <laughs> this the literary the literary piece um, basically is you know a fiction. Okay, so then the, the nonfiction would be the other piece of the informational text. It's what you do more. Yes, you know, science, yeah, the, the areas of like history, science, social studies, you know, chemistry, you know. That would, yes, that is informational. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So a bulk of the reading is going to be informational. That's, that's the point. It's moving toward that. Yeah, thank you. Um, the shifts, the next shift that I want to talk about is um, text complexity um, as well as academic language. Um, rather than just focus on the skills of reading and writing, just simply, um, we want to highlight the growing complexity of the text that students must read to meet the needs and demands of college and career. Um, it's closely related to text complexity, um, and it's also connected um, to reading comprehension. The focus is on academic vocabulary as well. That's part of this. Okay. Um, research has informed um, the department of the standards, and they revealed there was a significant gap. We talked about that in, in text complexity. Um, there was a study by Hayes and um, Wolfler, um, and this was cited in the standards. And um, they were showing that texts that students had read in 11th grade were much like the texts in 1961 that the seventh grade that seventh grade students were reading so there's been a change that was one one uh, bit of research that they looked at um, another uh, 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 study said that less than 50 percent of graduates can read sufficiently uh, complex text and so it's really important that we teach our kids to be independent readers that's the point yes 
The slide in back of me um, is text lexile measures. It's just kind of a graphic to give you an idea of um, the, where we are um, as far as text complexity. So it's an indiv individual's ability to um, reading ability and, as well as the difficulty of a text. And uh, they look at word length and they look at you know, um, sentence length as well. And um, if you'll take a look, you'll see, um, take a look or in the center on the graph where college textbooks, it's the center column. You'll see where that band falls, and the right in the center is at 1,200 lexiles. Um, if you look at high school literature and high school textbooks, you'll see that they're uh, quite uh, far below where the college level should be. So our kids who are leaving, you know, our senior year of high school, don't have the skills ready or skills needed to you know, um, enter college and be able to um, look at text and get meaning from it. So um, that's going to be changed. It's going to become more rigorous. And um, we're going to be changing the, the, uh, the left styles of Common Core will be changing. For example, um, if you want, if you'll take a look at the band on the left that's grades six through eight. The old left style ranges the standards that we have now from 1997, um, it was 862 um, 1010. It will bump up to, the band will be 955 through 1155, so about 95 points or so as far as moving up. So the text will be more rigorous. Any idea what you think the left style is of The Hobbit? 1,000. What about Gone with the Wind? Where do you think that would fit as far as um, lexile range? 700? Yes. A question. In other words, if a child, say their average is above average, say, as of today, when you change it to the new system, the possibility of their level might maybe bump down to average because of the expectations being increased? What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think you're going to have to face more difficult text, and I think that that might be true. What we consider an average reader might change. I would say that. Would you agree with that, Mrs. Golden? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay, good. Yes. So on the slide before, when they're defining the lexile ranges, in the bottom right-hand corner, the source is a national test data. So can you tell me how the state of California or our district compares in lexile measurements? Because it's kind of diluted if you look at all of the national test ranges. Right. Um, I wouldn't know how our district would measure up to that because, yeah, we, we don't have that information. So I, I don't know where we would fall in that. And what yeah. would you surmise would be the uh, AP class range? Would they already be performing above the standards? Well, that I think that depends. You know, on the, the left, but on the right, it shows it a little bit below. But um, you know, I I don't know currently where we would fall. I think that's is that what you're looking at? Well, I mean, if I had to guess, I would think if you were in high school in the Pleasanton district, you'd be more at the 1200 range, just knowing the, mm -hmm. how much is expected. That's, that's probably, you know, fairly accurate, I would say, yeah. Anybody else want to add to that? Can I? Suzanne? I, I was going to say that um, it depends on the courses that you are taking in high school. So our high schools, we service thousands of students, and at various levels. So on the slide to the far right, it shows AP. And what you can see is that's the last eye level that the material they would be tackling is at that level. More significantly, beyond college, if you take a look at entry level occupations, second from the right, you can see the lexile levels 
the expectations and the materials that employers are giving to their employees. So whether your child will move on to college or they'll try an entry-level career, there is an enormous gap between the two. And so as we go further with this, you'll see how we're going to approach tackling this and preparing your students to be ready to either enter college or the career. Um, and then secondly, I just wanted to note, we are getting all your questions that you're sending in. Many of them are related to testing. We will be addressing that towards the second half of the presentation. So be assured we see your questions and we will be uh, addressing those. Thank you, Sam. So our next shift or change in ELA instruction will be regarding speaking and listening. Um, students need to learn to work together, need to learn to communicate with one another, um, express, listen carefully to ideas, integrate information, and be able to um, evaluate sources and then able to communicate with others, you know, to achieve basically the purpose that they need to. So speaking and listening um, is another um, large uh, 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 aspect of the new Common Core Standards. Previously, we have it in the standards, but it's called um, listening and speaking. So the emphasis now is on speaking. And um, we want our students to have, um, you know, rich, structured experiences in speaking, not only in whole class settings, but small groups, partnership, you know. So we want them to have lots of experience with that. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the next slide is um, the shifts or changes that, will, that are taking place in um, the area of writing. Um, with our current standards, we have um, more genres of writing, modes of writing, and what the experts and research has shown um, is that, we're, that it's best to go into the three genres of writing that you see up here. We're going to be doing narrative, um, argumentative, and informational. Uh, to, yeah, a narrative, argumentative, and then um, informational and explanatory. The first narrative, um, there will be, I would say, less narrative writing, especially in high school. Um, you know, narratives convey experiences. They can be memoirs, you know, creative writing usually. That's not going away, um, but we're going to be focusing on the, the, the argumentation basically. So if you look at um, argumentative writing, that seems to be um, what we're looking at. The colleges are saying that, um, you know, we need to, our, to work in our K-12 systems, um, helping our kids be able to not only write um, argumentatively, but also to speak, you know, to be able to find evidence, prove your point, point and be able to, you know, substantiate what your issue or belief is. They want us to have, uh, want our kids to have sound arguments that you go through that, and that makes sense. There was a study also, um, his name is Jeffrey Graff, was the researcher, and this is, I think, from 2003, and um, he wrote about um, argument literacy, and he said, because basically, um, when you go to the university, it's an argument culture. And his research showed he said that about 20% of students incoming freshmen had those skills to be able to write argument of argument, arguments or to speak, you know, um, uh, to speak to arguments as well. So um, he, you know, claims that this was something that, you know, needed to be changed. And that's quite a shift, I would say, because um, and I think it's a wonderful shift um, in that, of course, you know, to grow up to be world citizens, we have to be able to, you know, state our point, but also to explain it and support it and show evidence for. 
And then the final genre of writing is informational, explanatory. And of course, that just, you know, you're just conveying information accurately. Um, this, you know, writing serves purposes, you know, to increase readers' knowledge usually, um, to help readers better understand a procedure, and that's going to be a portion of it as well. Now I'd like to turn this over to Dwayne Becker. 